Uh, I'm Bonnie Rano. I work at the State WIC office, and um, I'm here to introduce our speaker today for this very popular topic of the human gut microbiome. And uh, we're lucky that this is being videotaped today, and so uh, information that she's presenting, uh, her slide deck will be posted after this meeting on our website as well as the presentation itself. So uh, our speaker today is Lisa Sardinia. She's an associate professor at Pacific University. Uh, she received a Bachelor of Science degree in biology from Whitworth College, her PhD in microbiology from Montana State University, and a doctor of jurisprudence from the University of California, Hastings College of Law. So lots of schooling. <laughs> <laughs> Following graduate school, she was awarded a National Cancer Institute Research Fellowship at the University of California, San Francisco in molecular genetics. She now teaches uh, microbiology, basic science for optometry, and human genetics for physician assistants at Pacific University. She has been the recipient of the Thomas J. and Joyce Holst Endowed Professorship in Science and the S.S. Johnson Foundation Award for Excellence in Teaching at Pacific University. And just as an aside, uh, I went to college with Lisa, <laughs> so we know each other from way back. Um, and I'm just very um, proud and pleased to present her today to you to speak on the human gut microbiome. Thanks. I use these sometimes. Um, I was a theater minor in college, so unless this was, if this wasn't being taped, it's not like nobody could hear me. Um, nobody, I used to, I've taught in 300 person teaching theaters without a microphone, um, but it's being recorded, so I, I get that. Um, so I'm gonna start with, uh, first of all, thanks Bonnie. Um, yeah, we won't talk about what day, what date, what years we knew each other. Uh, it was a while ago. Um, so I have, a, I have a question for you all to start out with, though. Um, how many people here like chocolate? Uh, yeah, you think you like chocolate. You know who likes chocolate? Yeah. Um, it, it's possible that your gut bacteria like chocolate and um, that they send signals to your brain um, rewarding you when you eat chocolate. Yeah, we'll get to that, that whole free will business uh, in a while. Um, but, but let's get started here. So um, uh, the presence of what used to be called normal flora, which is a great term since they're not plants, but what used to be called normal flora uh, has been known for a very long time. Uh, that's not surprising that you have bacteria in your gut. That's, that's nothing new. Uh, but the significance of those microbes was really not appreciated until relatively recently. Um, again, when I took my first microbiology class, literally we spent maybe six minutes on all of the bacteria that are part of the normal flora. The bacteria in the gut were considered uh, what are called commensals. That is, they got an advantage. They were living in this nice, warm place, and you kept feeding them, because you keep eating. And maybe, maybe there were some minor services they provided, but it was more on the lines of, well, they, maybe they outcompete uh, pathogens, you know, disease-causing bacteria. And there were a few cute little things like E. coli. You all know E. coli, everybody knows E. coli. Um, E. coli can synthesize and secrete some vitamin K and vitamin B12, and maybe we absorb that, and then we'd be done. And we'd move on to another topic. But then, more recently, there began to be some very interesting reports coming out associating alterations of the gut bacteria with asthma, with autism, um, with cancers, certain types of cancer with obesity, with arthritis, and suddenly everybody got interested in this again. Um, and um, you, 
it, it began to interest people besides microbiologists. So um, first we started seeing articles appear in Time Magazine, the Atlantic Monthly, the New York Times Sunday section. So it wasn't just for people in a tiny area. Suddenly they were hitting the popular media. And a sure signal that gut microbiota uh, had reached the mainstream. Um, ads for companies that will test your microbiome, uh, books on how to cure pretty much anything um, by fiddling with your microbiome, um, usually with a specific diet, and supplements galore um, that will uh, aid your microbiota. Now, as is often or usually the case, when you're sort of at the beginning of what really is a new field, um, there are lots of studies being published. Some of them are contradictory. Um, they're in all different areas. So some people are looking at the microbiome in autism, and some people are looking at the microbiome in obesity, and some are, people are looking at microbiomes in humans, and others are looking at them in non-human animals. So it's, it's kind of a patchwork. Uh, there's a lot of intriguing data, but there is not one simple explanation for everything. We're not done yet. And if you were hoping at the end of today, I would you know, tie it up with a bow and, and hand it to you, that's not really going to happen. Um, it may not happen for a long time, if ever. Uh, but I can tell you about some of these intriguing preliminary studies. I give you a little more insight into what is going on in that human gut microbiome so that you can follow the, the um, as people learn more about this, keep up on the research. So I uh, always want to start with sort of some definitions and what is this human gut microbiome of which you speak? Um, so um, I should just mention that um, I, I have given this presentation several times. Uh, I've given presentations on epigenetics and stem cell research and genetic testing because at, at no matter what I do, I, no matter where I go, it's right there. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm really a biology geek. That's what I am. And I get interested in these kinds of things. Um, and my office um, <laughs> reflects it. My office is decorated. Is I have, I don't know, three dozen of them. Is that too many? <laughs> no. uh, maybe not. Anyway, uh, they, you can find these giant microbes. You can get stuffies. Um, I actually have a, somebody knitted, and it's in a, a dissection uh, pan. It is a knitted, dissected fetal pig. Oh, wow. <laughs> it ain't been, been non-wool yarn, so it's a vegan. <laughs> um, but it, it, just set, set the stage in and on your body you are outnumbered somewhere between three to one and ten to one by bacteria by microbes you are more microbial as a matter of fact you walk around in sort of a little microbial aura uh, you're shedding them all the time there's a little cloud around you uh, of, of microbes. Um, I'm a microbiologist, so that doesn't bother me. I think that's kind of cool. And in fact, you're probably outnumbered by about a thousand to one if we look at the genes. About a thousand to one microbial genes to one of your genes. Um, which again, I think is kind of cool. Um, all right. So, fun pictures to look at. Um, these microbes represent at least a thousand different species. Maybe more because we haven't identified them all. Um, but again, genetics, genetic analysis suggests there's an awful lot of them. And their genomes endow us with physiological capabilities that we would not have without them. Right? So it isn't that they're just around and they're good or they're bad. We have co-evolved to a point where we have physiological capabilities that we think are ours no, they're actually the bacteria doing it for us. Um, and there's some intriguing data that says there may have even been some transfer of bacterial genes to our genome in the past. But if we look at our genome, um, there's some genes on there that are awfully closely related to some bacterial ones. And we are not closely related to bacteria. 
think that way in the past, three and a half billion years ago. Um, we're gonna focus on the gut microbiota. Uh, the gut microbiota, that's the, the bacteria, that, or the microbes that live in your gut, weigh about three pounds total, uh, which is about the same as your brain. Coincidence? Um, that, it is, yeah. Um, so what do we mean by the gut microbiome or gut microbiota? Um, first, it's important to realize that all the bacteria that are part of your microbiome are actually on you and not in you. And that is because at an anatomical level, you are a donut. <laughs> yeah. There is a continuous tube that runs from your mouth to your anus, and bacteria that are inside that tube, in the stomach or the intestines, are not inside you. They are on a surface. It's a surface that's hidden away, unlike your skin. But unless they cross the barrier there, they're not inside you. And we don't normally have bacteria inside us. They are covering pretty much every surface, um, but they are, they are in some ways separate from us. Um, they're really external to you. Um, so where, where are they, um, the gut microbiome? Um, it was thought for many years that bacteria did not live in the stomach. They might traverse the stomach after you ate something that had bacteria and they would continue on through there, but they did not, there were no resident bacteria in the stomach. And then, um, of course, that was also at the time when it was thought that ulcers were caused by stress. Um, and then, um, I don't know if you know the story of the uh, folks, uh, the researchers in Australia, um, who were trying to convince people that no, ulcers are an infectious disease caused by bacterium called Helicobacter, Helicobacter pylori. And in fact, one of these researchers was so frustrated that nobody would believe him that he took a big, flask of Helicobacter pylori and drank it. Ew. And developed an ulcer which he cured with antibiotics. Um, so, so then though, now what happens? Oh my gosh, if we ever find bacteria in somebody's stomach, we should give them antibiotics. So that they don't get an ulcer if they don't already have one. Well, continue, and it turns out, no, maybe there are some resident bacteria. And it gets even worse. There seems to be a correlation with having Helicobacter pylori living in your stomach and an increased risk of stomach cancer. But there's another correlation between having Helicobacter pylori in your stomach and having a reduced risk of esophageal cancer. I don't know what to do with that information. This is, this is where we're at right now. That's kind of the deal. So it will work it out. I mean, people will get more data and we'll find out more about it. Um, but there are very few bacteria that live in your stomach. More as we start going through the small intestine, but things get real when you get to the colon. Okay, that's where um, the concentrations of bacteria are very high. So. Um, I'm, I'm kind of a concrete thinker for somebody who studies things that are invisible um, or very small. But when I see numbers like in the colon, there's 10 to the 11th or 10 to the 12th bacteria, and that's actually bacteria per cubic centimeter. I, I'm sorry, that kind of number, it, it doesn't make sense to me. It doesn't make sense to me in the, in the budget, the national budget, and it doesn't make sense to me in bacteria. Because um, I don't know what that means. Um, what, what, is that, what is that really like in there? So, okay, here's how much of a geek I am. So I'm sitting there thinking, how do I understand this? How would I, what could I compare it to? So I went to that most authoritative of all sources, Wikipedia, <laughs> and to look up what is the most crowded city on earth. And according to Wikipedia, and it actually doesn't matter as long as I find a crowded city, it is Manila. Uh, who knew? Um, and they, uh, in Manila, there's a, a 111,000 residents per square mile, um, which if you figure out how big Manila is, at which I went and looked, um, it, you do the calculations, it comes out to 250 square feet per resident, um, which I thought actually sounded like a lot for a place that was really crowded, but 
there's still all the buildings and cars and everything there. So even if you spread out everybody sort of evenly, it's pretty crowded. Okay, so that's fine. How does that compare to the crowding inside the colon? Well, um, it has been measured at 10 to the 11th to 10 to the 12th bacteria per cubic centimeter. Uh, cubic centimeter is a little less than a quarter teaspoon. All right, so I did some math. And here's what I found. If you thought of each bacteria as a human being living in a city, it would be as though there was one square foot per resident, <coughs> which is 250 times more crowded than the possibly most crowded city on Earth. Okay, so then it's it still not quite good, but I get it. It's crowded in there. That's the bottom line. I know, a long way around to say that. But I think it's worthwhile to sort of think about that. Think about when you're in a really crowded uh, situation uh, and imagine it being much more crowded than this. You'd all just stand up and be, be like this next to each other. Right? So that's actually, that, that crowding of those bacteria um, has led to a lot of natural selective pressures on what they do and how they interact with us. Um, so this is going to look like it's a really a sideline here in a minute, but it'll make sense. So we throw terms around, bacteria, microbes, germs, bugs. Um, what are we actually talking about there? What do we mean when we say all these things? Um, we are usually referring to things that are <laughs> really small. Uh, when the first day, on the first day of micro, my microbiology class, you know, what do microbiologists study? Things that are really small. Uh, and that's about their only cat categorization. They're just really small organisms. Um, so that's what we're, we're talking about here. Most of them are also single cell organisms. That is the entire organism is one cell. Everything that they do is in one, one cell makes up the whole organism. But there's a quite a variety of organisms that fit that definition. Um, now humans have an insatiable desire to categorize things. And actually it's one of the reasons we're so evolutionarily successful. Uh, is you know, categorizing, oh, I don't know, plants that are good to eat, plants that will kill you if you eat them. Good categorization there. But, but we just can't stop ourselves. And there's lots of ways to categorize things. Well, um, people have been doing it for a long time. We, if you've ever taken a biology class, you may have heard about the five kingdoms or the three domains. Uh, but people started categorizing organisms a long time ago. Aristotle was one of the first to publicly do this. And he categorized all living things on Earth into one of three categories. Animals, animal, vegetable, rational. <laughs> we were rational. <laughs> um, so it was all the animals in the world, all of the plants in the world, and humans. Um, that's just one way of categorizing things. And there have been lots of schemes over the years. And you know, one way to do it, this wouldn't necessarily be wrong, is to we could put together all things in one box that fly. All the animals that fly. Of course, that would put together birds and insects and mammals, but you would now have a box and you know if you look in there, it's something that can fly. All right? So that's not a, it's not a terrible way of doing it. It's one way of doing it, but the way scientists like to think about categorizing the world these days is by evolutionary relationships. Who are most closely related to and then more closely related to. And that gives us some surprises sometimes when you find out that whales and hippos um, are fairly closely related, and they're both closely related to cows. Who knew? Um, but, so rather than, you know, things that walk on the earth and things that swim in the sea, looking at their genetic background and looking at evolutionary relationships. Um, why am I telling you all this? Um, one of the most basic categories, way back, way, way back here, uh, divides uh, organisms into two categories based on what kind of cells they're made up of. And this division uh, divides prokaryotes and eukaryotes. If you've ever taken a, a science class, a biology class, you may have heard this, but the biggest thing is eukaryotes are the ones, who, these are the kinds of cells that make up you. And all animals, and all plants, and all fungi, yeast, mushrooms, all protists, all algae, all seaweed, all pond scum, all amoeba, pretty much everything you can think of that you can think of. 
are eukaryotes. Bacteria, germs, are prokaryotes. And there are significant differences in the actual fundamental structures of those two types of cells. Um, and you might say, well, there's fundamental differences between animals and plants. Yep, when you get down to the cellular level, not as much. Um, so it's also important to know that many microbes are also eukaryotes. So yeast, you can't really see an individual yeast cell without a microscope. Uh, lots of the kind of nastier diseases, a lot of the parasites and amoebas are, are um, uh, microbes, of some algae and slime molds. And then bacteria like E. coli are prokaryotes. So um, here's just some pictures of some microbes. We've got some yeast and some mold and animal giardia. Uh, some um, some algae, and that's like a non-cellular thing, a virus. But most of the human microbiome is, in fact, bacteria. This is if you color them, and you'll get them get the microscope. Uh, the pink things are E. coli, and the purple things on here are staph. Uh, like staph infections, you get staph all over your skin, actually. It's a normal, a normal part of your skin microbiome. We're going to come back to that staph thing in a minute. All right, so lots of words there, but where did you get your microbiome? You don't go to the microbiome store, generally. Although, well, <laughs> these days, you could almost do that a little bit more. So it has been assumed for a long time that before birth, a fetus does not have a microbiome that they are sterile, they have no bacteria. Again, some very recent results suggest that that might not be perfectly true. Um, but just some preliminary results. Nevertheless, what is known very well is that uh, the, the gut microbiome of a human, it really it is inoculated, gets started during the birth process. Okay, so that's where the initial gut microbiome is going to come from. Um, it's going to be um, as the, and I realize there's more ways to do this, but as the infant passes through uh, the birth canal will be exposed to the bacteria that are in the mother's vagina. But, of course, um, and so that's, that's what happens. As the baby is traveling through that, being <laughs> squished, there's some, the head particularly getting pretty squished, it's actually forcing bacteria into the nose and the mouth uh, of the infant. There's some swallowing, and that is how the gut microbiome starts. That's the initial inoculum, um, is what happens there. Um, so for infants that are born vaginally, if you look at the first bacteria right away that colonize the gut, they very much resemble human vaginal bacteria. That's what you find there. What happens if a baby is born through a cesarean section, though? What we find is that their gut bacteria, their initial inoculum, looks more like the skin bacteria of healthcare providers. <laughs> yeah, isn't that interesting? Yes. Um, it might also reflect, uh, depending on where they're born, uh, the parents, but if you're looking sort of o overall at this, that is what you will find, uh, that they will reflect more of a bi microbiome of healthcare providers than their mother. So, um, is that a problem? Uh, maybe, but let me just say that um, earlier this year, I think it was like February, I don't remember exactly, a paper was published in the journal Nature describing a proof of principle uh, study designed to transfer vaginal bacteria to um, infants that are born through cesarean section. Um, and there are people who have been doing this on their own for some time, uh, but this was actually um, sort of standardizing materials, amounts of time, and then actually measuring the effects on the infants um, so that if this is going to be used in a clinical setting, obviously you would, this can't sort of be ad hoc. It need, there needs to be a process. Um, and what, what the results were is that 
the infants that were exposed, uh, who were born by cesarean section, and then were exposed to their, their mother's vaginal um, bacteria, very quickly their gut microbiome resembled more, not entirely, but resembled more the microbiome of an infant that is, that is born vaginally. Um, and uh, this is an interesting, I think, little thing. The researcher who conducted the study has licensed the method, has actually patented it and licensed it to a biotech company in Boston to develop it. Um, although I, I will say, um, yeah, in a previous life for a while, I was a biotech patent attorney. Um, it has applied for a patent. Process patents are really hard to get, so I don't know what will happen. And could never, of course, prevent people from doing this themselves. Um, so that's a very interesting idea that this could happen. But the bigger question is, so what? Does it really matter? Do we, is there, are there consequences? You might say, well, there obviously are. No, no, no. Are there consequences to starting out with different gut microbiota? Because if there aren't, then this is, this is ridiculous. We don't care. Um, so um, it turns out that during the first year of a full-term infant's life, uh, the gut microbiota doesn't matter. Their mode of birth um, changes a lot during that first year. There are successive, what we call blooms, of different types of bacteria. So um, they don't stay the same. Okay, so they are going to develop during that first year, however they got inoculated in the first place. Um, they, uh, during that first year, they're gonna be exposed to lots of bacteria, including, depending on what they are fed, right? Whether they are, are fed um, uh, their mothers or some other human females, breast milk, or uh, some type of formula or the uh, milk of another mammal. Um, um, also, they are exposed to bacteria all the time. So here's another thing that nobody likes to think about, but you just have to get over it. Um, <laughs> the, the bacteria that are in your gut also leave your gut in feces. And there's kind of a fine film of fecal bacteria everywhere. Um, and my favorite is always when they talk about like, oh, they found these fecal bacteria, I found it on my cell phone. I don't really care, you know why I don't care? Nobody touches my cell phone except me. You know who's fecal bacteria on my cell phone? Mine! <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny the way people talk about that. Here's the one though that I, that I get, I always tell my students this. Um, in your bathroom, how far is your toothbrush from your toilet? Six feet. Yeah, when they backlight it, you see that. So this is like, uh, some of you may have ever been involved in a, in a discussion in your household about moving the seat up or putting the seat down. And here's my rule in my house. I don't care if you leave the seat up, I just need the lid down before you flush every time. That's my rule in my house. Um, because then you know what will happen? The lid, the inside of the lid will get bacteria, but now everything in my bathroom will be covered with a sheen of <laughs> diluted poop. <laughs> Go back to the story. During that first year, that infant is going to be exposed to uh, gut bacteria from other members of the household. Um, there's a weird little paper, which I love, that actually, I don't know how they get this money, but they did the study that shows that families with dogs are more likely to share gut microbiota than families without dogs. Uh, because uh, their hypothesis is that dogs lick one member of the family and then lick somebody else in the family. And members of the same family often don't lick each other. <laughs> stuff I need to read for my job. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's move on to uh, a term infant's gut microbiome. I told you there's six successive blooms over the first year. It's really the first three years is the development of the gut microbiome. 
And by the end of the third year, a full-term infant, by the end of their third year, their gut microbiome uh, resembles an adult's. Uh, that doesn't mean it will never change. These are not static things, but it resembles the average gut microbiome of an adult. Um, it's highly influenced by nutrition source. Um, breastfed infants have a gut microbiome that is dominated by bifidobacterium and lactobacillus. I'm going to talk about some of these terms. Um, these are names of bacteria, but those two bacteria dominate um, in the gut microbiome of infants that are breastfed. Infants that are born by C-section, first of all, start out with a lot of staph, a lot of staphylococcus in their guts. And if they um, are not fed breast milk, they still don't have a lot of bifido or lactobacillus. Again, is this a bad thing or a good thing? Right now, we're in the sort of the level of phenomenology. It just is. This is what we find. Um, there is an, an interesting thing um, that seems somewhat counterintuitive. Breastfed infants have a lower diversity of gut microbiota. Um, infants that are fed formula have more different types of bacteria. And Generally, we think diversity is a good thing. A lot of diversity, so there's a lot of resilience. So, but again, this is only for a short period of time, right? This is not throughout some, uh, an organism's life. Um, as a matter of fact, in an infant, bifido uh, bacteria uh, can constitute 90% of the gut microbiome. Um, so it's a, it, it, it's a, it's a pretty, um, there's a lot of bacteria in these, children, in these babies' guts, there are just not very many different kinds at that point. Um, in an adult, if we looked at, at your gut microbiota, uh, bifidobacteria would, would uh, constitute maybe three to six percent. Um, so there's a, an enormous change over these, um, these three years. Um, so it's, um, so, and again, these little circles just indicate the relative amounts of each of those types of bacteria, which, which actually, uh, for a minute here, I think it's worthwhile to talk just briefly about what those, those names of those bacteria mean. Um, again, I told you that humans like to categorize things. And we like to categorize things in, if you've ever taken a biology class, you may have heard about domains and kingdoms and phyla and class and order and family. I always have to look. This was not my thing. Um, never has been my thing, classification. But the idea here is that um, all organisms who are really closely related, like all human beings or all uh, camels, are in one species. So that you're, you're genetically really closely related. And then the species that are closely related would get lumped together in a genus. And humans are so funny. We have a genus all to our own. Um, for no reason, really, <laughs> scientifically. But then camels might have camels and dromedaries that would be in the same genus. And the next level is family. So um, family hominidae would be humans, gorillas, bonobos, orangutans, and chimpanzees. And over in the Strathionidae, uh, you would have like camels, uh, dromedaries, uh, llamas, alpacas, right? And then you go to the next level and you bring in more, right? So um, why am I telling you this? The, the words I have on here, these are not the names of individual species of bacteria. They are family names. Uh, and in some cases, we've only really identified the types of bacteria in the gut to class or order or even phylum. So when we talk about this, it, we do not have all the organisms identified. And in fact, the identification is not by taking a sample of feces and isolating every bacterium and growing it and identifying it. It's doing uh, just sort of uh, what's called blast sequencing, just looking at all the genes that are there and saying, some of these look like the bacteria that we know of that are in the lactobacilli ACE, so we'll call them that. So it's, it's a kind of a high level. It's sort of like saying that at one month, 
um, there's more mammals than birds, and at six months there's more birds than mammals. But it could be any kind of mammal or any kind of bird. Okay. So we, we haven't drilled down, scientists haven't drilled down uh, incredibly low at this. But So that's what we're talking about, is kind of a high, big groups of bacteria. Um, all right, so one question, this is, I love this. One question that puzzled scientists for years was the idea that mammalian milk, human milk, but other mammals as well, contain a bunch of sugars that are completely indigestible by humans. And this is true for other mammals as well. And the reason this puzzled scientists so much is that mammalian milk is one of the only substances on Earth that is produced to be consumed. Like, what does that even mean? <laughs> it means plants don't make potatoes for you to eat them. It means that cattle don't produce muscles so you can have a steak. But there is no other purpose for mammalian milk than to be consumed by another individual. Right? That's actually one of those things I'm like, that's really weird. Um, and somebody, one of my students said, what about honey? And I said, yeah, but honey is kind of just regurgitated nectar. Synthesizing human milk, there's all kinds of genes that are involved in producing this. There has been evolutionary pressure, there's been selective pressure. The stuff that's in mammalian milk is not randomly there. It takes energy for a mother to produce this, including sugars that her baby cannot digest. So, this is always fun too, many, many years ago, when companies started producing formula at first, they knew these sugars were in milk, and they're like, but they can't digest them, so we won't put them in the formula, because clearly they're not needed, because humans can't digest them. So who digests those sugars? Of course we know the answer, the gut microbiome. Because this, we have been evolving with our gut microbiome for so long that we actually produce produce food for them. <laughs> That's some selective pressure right there. That we would be willing to feed a thousand other species. Yeah. Which brings us to probiotics and prebiotics. I told you the, the human microbi gut microbiome is a big deal now and boy, probiotics and prebiotics. Um, Efforts to replicate the intestinal microbiota of breastfed infants in formula-fed infants has led to changes in uh, formula, formulations, um, and looking at what kinds of ingredients selectively can feed the types of gut microbiota that we think at this point are good to have. So that's going to change over time. Um, well, many um, probiotics are bacteria or yeast. They're living organisms. And I will tell you, I don't know. People say, should you eat probiotics? Yeah, sure. What the heck? It's not going to hurt you. Really not going to hurt you. Um, but if you drink, if you eat your little container of yogurt, is that really going to change the composition of that gut microbiome? If you've just been blasted with antibiotics, it's probably a really good idea. To just This should be your new diet. Um, I should look at that going, I think I'm good. <laughs> Yogurt, cheese, bread, and wine. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, so that's what probiotics. Prebiotics are food for bacteria. And often, prebiotics are what we previously called soluble fiber. Remember, you're supposed to eat soluble fiber for your heart. Now you eat soluble fiber for your bacteria. Um, resistant starch is another term that's sometimes used. Um, but these are, again, molecules, food molecules that humans cannot digest. We don't have the enzymes, but the bacteria do. Um, and it, it feeds them. 
Um, so, um, so once again, I, I started thinking, sometimes I think about too much about these things, but I started thinking about this and I thought, um, okay, so you need some soluble fiber, and you need some resistant starch, and you need all these things. No, notice that these are fruits, vegetables, legumes, whole wheat. Um, and so I started thinking about the paleo diet. And, um, and I started thinking about it a lot. Um, which it, I have to say, if, if you're on the paleo diet, you eat whatever you want. Um, but I've always thought, when I first read it, I thought, so you're supposed to eat what paleolithic humans ate, because it's, we're, I thought that paleolithic humans died when they were 30. I'm not sure that was the best diet. But that wasn't actually the thing. So when I started, then I started thinking about what about carnivores, actual carnivores, big cats and things. They just eat meat. So they don't get, they don't get any of these things, and I know that they have gut bacteria. So how is that working? So I didn't, this was bothering me. This bothered me a lot. Um, and so a couple of things, uh, so I found out a couple of things I'm going to share with you. One is a recent study, not surprisingly, that showed that Paleolithic humans, of course, ate grains because Paleolithic humans could not be picky. Paleolithic humans ate whatever came up, which was a lot of meat and probably some roots and berries and grains. That's not first of all. But the other thing that still didn't help me with the carnivores. Then I thought about it. And if you think about when a carnivore, tiger or lion or house cat, eats a gazelle or a bird, do you know what they eat? Everything. They do not eat, rarely do they eat a steak. They eat tendons, they eat cartilage, they eat hair, skin, and feathers. And so, here's the deal. If you want to do the paleo diet, it's <laughs> fine. <laughs> but you have to eat the whole no. chicken. Um, so again, I, I've given some presentations on epigenetics, and now I'm doing microbiome and microbiome and obesity. And it is possible that all of this is um, me just trying to find the reason why it's not my fault. Um, can your gut microbiota make you fat? Um, well, let's uh, let's see. So much actually of what we know about this so far. Uh, what we've learned uh, comes from association studies, uh, which are good starting points, but also from um, uh, experiments using non-human animals, primarily rodents, in particular something called germ-free mice. Uh, so germ-free mice um, are, are exactly that. They are not, they are not germ-free as in they don't have pathogenic disease-causing bacteria. They have no bi microbiome. Not a gut one, not a skin one, nothing. They uh, are born through cesarean section. Um, they are fed sterile food, sterile water, and they are kept in a sterile environment. Um, and here's, here's the not surprise. They're not very healthy um, at all. Um, but they have no gut microbiota. But one thing that can be done with these mice is that they can be given a gut microbiota that's completely defined. You give them gut microbiota from another mouse. You can count. You can figure out the bacteria you want to give them, and give them a fecal transplant, which we now do with humans. Uh, so they can be given um, a gut microbiome. Um, so they can get wild type. Um, they can get specific ones. They can be fed different diets. Combining with different bacteria, so you can do all kinds of experiments that you cannot do um, in humans. And it turns out that it is very clear from these studies that the gut microbiota do help regulate energy balance. Okay. Do they make you fat? I don't know, but they do help uh, regulate uh, energy balance. Germ-free rodents have to eat more to maintain the same weight. Um, and we'll, we'll see why in a second, but that, that's just a fact, that if you have, if you have zero gut uh, microbiota, um, probably are not absorbing some things, and you have to eat more if you're a, a mouse, and probably any other organism. That's if you have none, though, which is not going to be the case for any, any humans. Um, nevertheless, there you go. They need to eat a third more calories than normal rodents to maintain their body weight. Um, 
All right, so that's, uh, that's an, an interesting thing. What, what, that, what that tells us, though, is that gut microbiota are clearly going to be involved in energy balance, right? In, in converting calories in food to uh, calories inside your body. Um, but of course, it's, it's complicated. Um, and here's an interesting thing, very interesting. So let's say we have some germ-free mice who are, have to eat a lot, have to eat a third more calories, and they get a fecal transplant. They get the gut microbiota of sort of a normal weight mouse. Um, they have to eat a little bit less to maintain their body weight, but they normally will. They'll just eat less. If, however, they are given the um, uh, gut microbiota of an obese mouse, as there are some mice that are actually genetically obese, um, even if they don't eat more, they will become obese. But if they are given the gut microbiota of very lean mice, they now have gut microbiota, and even if they ate the same amount before, they will lose weight. I know. So you start thinking, do I want a pickle transplant? Yes. <laughs> 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 but then there's another, then there's this whole other thing about, you know, about the cold business right? The cold business. So it turns out that, and, and first, this first part of it is, is not surprising. We'll go through, it's a busy slide. We'll go through some of it in a second. So um, it, you expend more energy when you are cold than when you are warm, right? Because we're warm-blooded animals. To maintain that body temperature, you have to expend more energy. So that, that's not surprising. Um, and but, but what does that mean? Well, there are actually some people who have, it's hard to do some of these experiments, but you can look at association studies about calories consumed by people who live in different parts of the world, cold or warm, but that also is, a, and how much they weigh, that's a little bit tricky because um, if you live in a cold part of the world, it's not like you just hang out outside in shorts, mm -hmm. right? So it means being cold, not merely existing in a place that is cold. And there are some people who have taken this to sort of extremes, there's this one guy who he's just, he is such a believer that humans should live colder than we do. And so he has trained himself to sleep in a room where it is 55 degrees, which I actually like with a big comforter. No, with no covers. In <laughs> shorts and a t-shirt. Um, he also, he's a runner, and when it's really cold, he, he, he covers his, his ears, his feet, you know, and he, he's He's legal <laughs> and close, but other than that, he's 32 degrees. He's out there running, um, and he's pretty lean. You know, this is the N of one, so I don't know what we do with that. Um, but there was actually an experiment that they did with some people, and they had two groups of people uh, controlled their diet and had some of them sleep at um, I don't know, at 70 degrees, um, and the other group slept at 62. Uh, and the people who slept at 62 degrees, on average, up lost some weight in people at 70 degrees. So what does that mean? Don't know. But, <laughs> but here, this, so now, let's look at an actual experiment. They can't, well, maybe you can do it with humans. But here's an interesting thing. So how many people here have ever heard of brown fat? Heard of brown fat? Okay, so infants have, infant, mammalian infants have, human infants have brown fat. Um, and brown fat, unlike white fat, white adipose tissue is how we call it, so white fat. What? White adipose tissue is storage, right? That's just where you store it. And brown adipose tissue is not storage. You burn the fat, not for energy, for heat. And babies have it because babies can't shiver, so they do non-shivering thermogenesis. And bears have it to wake up in the spring after they can sleep. Um, and so some people said, well, what if you could have more brown fat? You could stay warmer and you could eat more because it would burn up calories. So how do we do that? Well, let's see what happens. So what they did is they had two sets of mice. Mice that, when it says warm, they just lived in cages like, like this, like room temperature. And then they had mice that were slowly adapted to a cooler temperature. Uh, so they were cold adapted mice. So first of all, they looked and they found that the cold adapted mice that lived all their lives, they don't have little comforters at night, all their lives at colder temperatures had more brown type fat, not really brown fat, it's beige, 
Um, but it just means that they have more of this one particular uh, protein in their white adipose tissue that allows them to burn fat for heat instead of for other types of energy. Um, but they also had, uh, it, when, they, when they analyzed their gut microbiota, um, they were different. Oh, there was some more stuff here. So uh, the mice that lived in colder temperatures ate more and weighed less. Okay, so they could eat more and maintain a, a lower body weight. Um, they also, their blood sugar levels dropped and their insulin sensitivity went up. Yeah, that was interesting. Um, and when they, when they looked at their gut microbes, the gut microbiota of the warm adapted mice and the cold adapted mice, there were differences in the ratios of different um, gut microbiota. But here's another thing. They actually, the cold adapted mice, if you measured the length of their gut, it was longer. Yeah, that's weird. But perhaps because they're cold, they need more energy, so perhaps they grew more gut so they could absorb more of the nutrients that they consumed. But that, that's all fine, that's phenomenology. Here's the good stuff, here's the interesting stuff. So, let's take some of the bacteria from the cold adaptive mice <laughs> guts and put it in the guts of the warm adaptive. We're not gonna put them in the cold, they get to stay warm. They just get some of those gut bacteria. Well, so we're not worried about the beige and white fat now, just the gut bacteria. Well, these warm adapted mice who got cold adapted gut bacteria, lost weight, blood sugar levels went down, insulin sensitivity went up. And remember, they're still in the warm. They're still warm. All the only difference is they got new bacteria, they grew longer guts. The bacteria turned on genes in the mice to make them grow more gut. Which is borderline creepy, <laughs> um, but interesting. So, so what, again, this is just, sort of, there's a, what does all this mean? It all means that there is a very close relationship between um, our gut microbiota and us and it is involved in how much nutrients are absorbed, it's involved in blood sugar levels, it's involved in insulin sensitivity, and we'll learn more about this. Um, I don't know right now that you should get a, a fecal transplant because you don't know enough about it, but that's, again, I told you it's preliminary, that's where we're at. Um, right. Uh, this has been an interesting area of research because one of the questions central to microbiome research is why people in modern society who have eliminated most of the causes of inflammation, which are infectious disease, have more inflammatory disease than people in third world countries. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Huh. It doesn't make any sense. So the, the biggest causes of inflammation are infections by bacteria and viruses, and we haven't eliminated them, but boy, have we beaten those back down. And yet, inflammatory diseases like asthma, um, other allergies, uh, autoimmune diseases are higher here than pretty much any uh, a, a less developed country that you can come up with. So that doesn't make any sense on its face. Um, well, this is, the, I just relax about this slide. <laughs> I can't draw so I have to find slides on it, but we're just gonna focus on a couple of things. So here's the point I'm trying to make about this slide. Um, you probably all know this as well. When babies are first born, they don't have a full-blown immune system. Right? Their immune system is, is still immature. Their immune system develops over the first several years, but particularly over the first, hmm, say it with me, three years. What else develops over the first three years? Gut microbiome. And in fact, it is now quite clear that the developing gut microbiome 
is actually training the immune system. That, and this is actually one thing in those germ-free mice, their immune systems never develop. If they're ever exposed to anything, they will probably die uh, because their immune systems do not develop um, correctly. So this is, it's not the entire thing. It's not like you will never develop an immune system. And again, all humans do have some gut microbiota, but how they train it is interesting. And here is a very interesting thing. There's one particular type of immune cell called a T regulatory cell. And these regulatory cells are sort of involved in regulating the immune response. So when you get an infection, the T regulatory cells say, yep, let's ramp it up. We have, we, we, there's a bacterium in, this, in, in our lungs that we gotta get rid of it. But at some point, the T regulatory cells say, enough is enough. We got rid of it, let's damp this down, this inflammatory response. Um, not gonna talk about inflammation, but the inflammatory response is one of the best, um, best evidence that this is not intelligent design. Um, it is, uh, I could say it's scorched earth policy. There's a huge amount of collateral damage. Uh, you know this, if you ever cut yourself or you stab, you stab or you get a wound and it gets all red and sore and swollen, is that necessary? Um, could you design something better? Possibly, but this is how it works. Um, and it's, you know, good enough. And it does get rid of the, the bad stuff, but it's, it's not fabulous. And if it keeps going, that's terrible. So you have these T regulatory cells that damp down that inflammatory response once the threat is over. And it turns out that in individuals who don't have the typical infant gut microbiome, and by that I mean vaginal birth and breastfed, because if we think about the evolutionary history of humans, you know, the last hundred years is that much. So for most of the evolutionary history of humans and their predecessors, um, living humans were born vaginally and were fed breast milk. Right? Um, which means a lot of babies died that now get to live, but that was the deal. And those types of bacteria, the ones that are found in the guts of babies who are born vaginally and, and drink breast milk, get a lot of T-reg cells. And those that don't, don't. Does that mean that, and again, you have to be careful of this, does that mean that babies that are born vaginally and have breast milk will never have asthma, allergies, no. Does it mean that every child that's born by C-section and has formula will, no. But there's certainly a difference if we look at, it's a correlation. And um, it, it's one of those things where you talk about this and people say, well, I know somebody. It's like, I know somebody too. I'm talking about population statistics here. Um, so um, alterations, again, to an infant's gut microbiota, they're different than sort of the standard historical one, can lead to lower levels of T reg cells, which could lead to a susceptibility to more inflammatory type diseases. Did I put enough possible maybes in there? Um, but we're not done just after three years old. Um, it is possible to screw up your microbiome later, right? I mean, uh, we do all kinds of interesting things now that ancient humans did not do. Antibiotics is one, but diet, you know, peeps. <laughs> um, so, but all kinds of things. And infections could damage the intestinal lining. So a normal lining of your intestines has cells, they're, they're hooked together by these little tight junctions, so stuff can't leak between, and they're covered with mucus. That's a healthy lining. But if it's damaged, it is possible now for the bacteria that were living fine, remember they're still outside your body when they're in your gut, but they could get across a damaged lining. And that happens, that happens all the time. And immune cells there just mop them up and everything is fine. But what if that happens a lot? Um, you get leaky gut. And now you have bacteria, parasites, and it says here harmful. They might even be harmful. They might be bacteria that, nor that are perfectly fine as long as they stay in your gut. 
but now they end up in the respiratory system or your joints and the immune cells that are there go whoa this is so not right we're not supposed to have these here and they attack them and as they attack them again i said inflammation has a lot of collateral damage when you it, when there's inflammation in a joint it doesn't just get rid of the bacteria it causes damage there um, and so, the more you have a leaky gut, again, one little nick here and there, it's like on your skin, every time you get a cut in your skin, you don't get a full-blown internal staph infection, right? Same thing here. But over time, you could damage it or set up a situation where the gut really is leaky. And that could lead to an inflammatory response far away from the gut. You think, what does the asthma have to do with the gut? It doesn't, exactly, unless bacteria from the gut get through your bloodstream to the, um, the um, uh, respiratory system. So, asthma, inflammatory bowel disease, celiac disease, lupus, some cases of those um, could be influenced by this. They all have genetic components as well, um, but certainly they could be influenced by this. Um, and maybe, Maybe they are more common now because in overdeveloped countries, we all just have these hyperreactive immune systems because we didn't treat our, um, our gut bacteria well, particularly when we were young. And it turns out that sometimes, even though you can screw it up later, that three year window at the beginning, it's sometimes even smaller. Um, there are certain times in there that seem to be key where messing with the gut microbiota um, just triples, quadruples, tenfold increases in asthma, for example. Um, so that first three years is, I'm telling you all, the first three years are key. That's kind of funny. Um, you all know that. Um, all right. Free will. Your gut microbiota and free will. Um, this is a, a fun one. And again, this started out with um, actually, people looking at individuals with autism, because it turns out that there is a very high rate of intestinal difficulties with people who have been diagnosed with autism. Not a perfect correlation, but there's a lot of correlation. So that's just a, that's a correlation. Correlation is not necessarily causation, but it gives you some place to go look. It's like, hmm, I wonder what's going on here. So. Um, Let's look at the gut-brain axis. Not the axis of evil, evil the gut-brain <laughs> axis. Um, turns out that one of the uh, cranial nerves, there are, I think, 12 cranial nerves, and uh, this is one of those I had to memorize one time, and I did one of those mnemonics, and so this is in college. I can remember the mnemonic. <laughs> no idea what the cranial <laughs> nerves are, <laughs> um, except the one I'm going to talk about, the vagus nerve. Uh, so the vagal nerve that goes from your, from your brain down and ends in a number of places, but in your gut. And um, the vagus nerve does a lot of different things. It's the one that makes you, uh, some people faint when they see something gross, right? The vagal basal response. Uh, it's just like, oh, I can't look at that, and over you go. Um, but it also, again, it interacts with cells in the gut. And there's bacteria in the gut. Here's an interesting thing about some of the bacteria in the gut. Um, remember, these are single cell organisms. They do not have a nervous system. They're just one cell. However, many of your gut bacteria have genes that allow them to produce neurotransmitters. But they don't have receptors for neurotransmitters. They do not communicate with one another through neurotransmitters. They communicate with you through neurotransmitters. And they produce a lot of them. Um, actually, um, it may include GABA, it's a GBA there, gamma amino butyric acid. This is a major inhibitory neurotransmitter um, in the central nervous system. It's the anti anxiety neurotransmitter. As a matter of fact, this, the uh, same receptor for GABA, the receptor for GABA is the same receptor for Valium. And bacteria in your gut produce it sometimes. <laughs> fed them chocolate, um, they will calm you down. Um, 
kind of interesting. Um, and then uh, this is, okay, the geekiest slide I have. And some of you will get this and some of you won't, but it's okay. Um, <laughs> don't, don't go over there. Don't go there. Okay. So these are two other neurotransmitters. Um, and when you say you like things or things make you happy, it means that those things cause the release of serotonin and dopamine. And they, they get you in your reward centers. Who else makes serotonin and dopamine? You know the answer now. Or bacteria in your gut. Um, so when you eat the correct foods, the nutrients for gut bacteria, they reward you by producing GABA, serotonin, and dopamine. Um, and they break down components in the chocolate uh, polyphenols into smaller molecules that can be absorbed into your bloodstream where they reduce inflammation in your blood vessels. So we talked about you know, dark chocolate is good. It, if, you, if, you, if you were a germ-free mouse and you ate dark chocolate, it would not be good for you. Um, but talk about here is a symbiotic relationship. If you eat chocolate, bacteria will reward you with neurotransmitters and they will use some of the compounds in the chocolate for food for themselves, but they will convert <laughs> other compounds in the chocolate into food for you. I know, exactly, wow. That's, this is, I do that a lot when I'm reading about the human gut microbiome. Wow. Um, so this is a, this really is back and forth. Um, the, it's a back and forth, so the, uh, up here we have the, um, SR center is the, the social reward center, and the FR center is the food reward center. Um, but there's, there's that back and forth here um, that, that definitely um, uh, has an effect. And if you look at, again, these are all correlations right now in humans, what's happening in individuals with autism, you see that in, a, in addition to the, the behaviors, the things that we use to diagnose somebody uh, on the spectrum, there are also a number of physical characteristics. Um, and it turns out that, again, there have been studies in, in rodents. It turns out that there is an inducible model of autism in mice. Um, and how do you measure that? Well, you can actually measure social behaviors in mice very well. And by feeding pregnant mice a particular compound, it will alter the brains of their infants, mice, and they will have a difficulty dealing with other mice. It turns out that's actually what happens. And they have a different gut microbiota composition. Um, so very intriguing results here. And it also makes you wonder about people who have said, I, my child's Behaviors are different when I feed them different diets. Um, there's probably something to that for some of them. Um, one of those people who think that perhaps you should not rely entirely on a book written by an actress to decide what to feed your child. But you can if you want. Nevertheless, the idea that diet could relieve or exacerbate symptoms in somebody in autism is, I mean, that's pretty obvious. The question is what exactly those nutrients should be, I think, at this point. And so that's what people are studying right now. So um, uh, what does the, um, what is the future, I know, I think kids are so cute. You can even get not just bacteria, you can get other cells. I have a white blood cell and I have platelets. And I have a neuron, I have, a little, I have an egg cell and a sperm cell. I have some, I have tardigrades, I have little water bears and mites. Yeah. She is, a, yeah, I just, oh, she's really All right, so, some things that are happening right now. Uh, you may have heard of one of the worst things that could happen to humans, Clostridium difficile infection. And again, C. diff is actually a normal inhabitant of the gut. It's supposed to stay at its correct percentage. Um, and when you get overgrowth of that, uh, you can get a completely untreatable uh, serious diarrhea. Now, some people can be treated for it, but what do you do when it's just completely untreatable? Fecal transplants. 
um, which sound gross, but again, if you've had diarrhea for two years, you'd be open to a lot of options. <laughs> but here's the interesting thing too, because there have been a few studies that have come out saying it can help this or this or this, so there are only a few doctors who are doing this right now, but there was an interview with one guy in the Bay Area who does this, and he says he gets calls all the time from people who wanted to like cure their acne. Um, and, and it's interesting because of course they do uh, test the donor uh, material, but this is so new. How do they know that there might not be something in there? It's just like blood testing, you know, early on it's like, it, um, so until I get a C. diff infection, I'm gonna hold off for <laughs> <laughs> now. Um, and I did think, but here's the gross thing I thought about though. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna hang out with really skinny people and have them fix all my meals and they're not allowed to wash their hands after they go to the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, okay, so um, this is an interesting thing because here's breaking news, too late for me to even put it in there. So what about treating ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease? Um, there was, this is, I, I love these, there was a report that just came out and I love looking at what the media says and what the scientists had said. So the report was, we have found the cause of Crohn's disease. Ha! Huh. Um, what the scientists said is, we have found three microbes that are found in higher percentages in people with Crohn's disease. <laughs> Not exactly the same thing, but it turns out there are three bacteria that are present, there are two bacteria in a yeast. It's E. coli, serratia marcescens, and a, and a candida tropicalis, I think, uh, that are really high concentrations. Which does, but they find it in people who have Crohn's disease. Maybe they have those high concentrations because they have Crohn's disease, right? But it's, it's a place to go and look. And so, um, if in fact uh, a significant part of the development of something like Crohn's disease is the contents of the microbiota and not just genetics, we know there's also a genetic component, clearly, there just is. But if in fact it really, really, a lot of the symptoms are due to an altered composition, then a fecal transplant would work. Trying it, um, and here's the deal on Crohn's disease, trying it, just to see if it would work. Um, people with ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, um, sometimes, I mean, you know, a, a, a colonoscopy can set them off. So doing a fecal, doing the procedure could be a problem. Although there are now some ways to package it in a capsule and swallow it. Um, I know you're like, oh, no. <laughs> um, gotta get over this. Um, and so, I, I'm sure people are absolutely looking into this, but it's not quite at the point where it's, and I don't know that there aren't people doing it because fecal transplants are now approved, and you know how doctors can do stuff off label, right? So, um, but, I, but you have to be a little bit cautious because you don't want, certainly don't want to make things worse, right? Um, all right, and the, the thing, so um, there's something called the Human uh, Gut Microbiome Project. And they would like, they would like some poop from everybody. <laughs> I have their website on here later. Um, but Michael Pollan, who is my hero, uh, if you don't know who he is, he should become your hero immediately. Anyway, he, um, he decided to have his gut microbiota analyzed, and he brought in his buddy, Jeff Leach. Maybe it's him. <laughs> to go and have their gut microbiota analyzed, again, at that level of sort of family. And part of it was because um, Michael Pollan follows a particular, not a particular diet, he follows the best diet in the whole world. That is, nothing is forbidden. Should, you should uh, what, eat food, not peeps, which are edible food-like substances. Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. That's it. Jeff Leach is apparently a devout carnivore. Okay, so they uh, did this, and they will actually, if you have this done, they will compare your sample, sort of the relationship of permacutes bacteria to it, and this is now at like the class level, not even family. Average, similar diet, same gender, compared to people with similar age, similar BMI, here's Michael Pollan over here, 
and um, uh, so they compared it, and they were, and then most abundant microbes, your most enriched microbes, um, and they were quite different, which leads to an interesting point. What is the perfect gut microbiome? Um, it turns out that it depends on where you live in the world, what your diet is, um, and so this is kind of an interesting thing. It, it's very clear that certain gut microbes are not terrific to have high concentrations in your gut. They're really highly correlated with not great stuff happening. Um, but it's not a rigid thing that you have to have. And our gut microbiota are fairly resilient, which of course there would have been selective pressure for that. Imagine if all during human history, every time you ate something not so good, it, you died. Well, and that kind of gut microbiota wouldn't be on Earth anymore. But So you can eat a peep. Why would you eat one? or a Twinkie, and it would be okay. It's just that that's your main diet, it might be an issue. But in fact, who has the healthiest gut microbiota? I don't know. Um, uh, I don't know. And that's what they're kind of trying to find out. So, so, what should you do? What is to be done? Well, here's the stuff, pollen, eat food, good idea. Uh, this is another one of my sister. My sister had type two diabetes and has done a lot to, to reduce her symptoms. She read this thing and said, cook more, eat less. Oh, interesting. Um, here is one, though, that usually I don't try to get too much on a soapbox, except for the peep thing. Uh, but here is one that this, rarely when I read about, I think it's all cool, but I'm rarely terrified. All right, this terrified me. All right, so I told you that a healthy gut has mucus lining it, well, there are the mucus bacteria, and there are the middle of the intestines bacteria. They do not mix. And the mucus bacteria live in the mucus right up next to your cells. And only certain bacteria get to do that. And they're really important because this is crazy. When you eat food, you absorb it through the lining of the intestines. And it passes right through the cells that line the intestines and go into the bloodstream. And those cells lining the intestines, they get nothing. They get no food. Oh, how do they survive? The mucus bacteria take some of the food, ferment it, produce fatty acids, and feed their next door neighbors. Oh, I know. OK, you know what emulsifiers do? They dissolve your mucus. Oh, I know, it's horrible. So. So what is the deal here? Because humans have been eating emulsifiers for a long time. Lacithin is found in egg yolks. There's, but we ate not much of it. Now, so you know you've been looking at the, when you buy something, you look at the, the nutrients on there, and you've been all been looking at the saturated fats and the simple sugars. That's nothing. This is what you got to look for, the emulsifiers. Oh, and the high fructose corn syrup, poison. Um, no, this is, and it's everywhere. Oh my gosh, it's in bread, for crying out loud. I have to make my own ice cream now because they put gums in all the ice cream. Uh, so really, really, really trying to reduce that. It's terrible. It is probably one of the leading causes of leaky gut syndrome. All these emulsifiers. Say no to the emulsifiers. Um, eat some fermented foods. Feed your gut microbiome. Uh, apparently, everywhere you look, Jerusalem artichokes. But I'm good with the rest of it. I'll eat all the rest. Okay, minimize use of antibiotics, particularly in that first three years, which does not mean don't give a child who is dying of an infectious disease antibiotics. Of course, use antibiotics. Use them judiciously. But particularly in a developing microbiota, it's an issue. However, as you may or may not know, over 80% of all antibiotics in the United States are consumed by non human animals, not to cure or prevent disease, but just to make them grow faster. So get out there and, and fight for that one. And stop being so clean. When you're, if you have babies crawling around, putting stuff in their mouth, oh, don't do that? Yeah, let them do it. It's good for them. I think my sister spent one year as a child pretty much eating dirt. I think that was her primary source of calories. All right. Lots of information. So there's two good books that I can recommend here. This is all going to be posted, right? The PDF? 
of this. So you can all frantically write down, but you can all go look. Um, yeah. um, two things here that I want to mention. The Human Food Project are the people who are doing the gut microbiome project. So you can read more about that uh, and send them a sample. Um, this, I sometimes hesitate to recommend this, but it's great. It's called thescientist.com. It's an online magazine, um, and it's free. Uh, you can register, and I register, and it comes to my mailbox, my email every day. Here's why it's so cool. They have like some of the best writers in the world who are combing the literature for new publications in the life sciences. When one looks interesting, they write like a three-paragraph summary. Yeah. You can read, but if you want more, there's a link to the original paper. Here's why I, don't, I hesitate to suggest it, though. When you go to their site, you will wake up six hours later <laughs> and you have clicked your way to, oh, that's interesting. What is that? Um, and then two pages of step three. I know, don't try. But there's all sorts of good stuff here, depending on what you're interested in, from some of my favorite writers like Carl Zimmer and, uh, of course, Michael Pollan. Um, and, and so that will all be posted. You can find all of those links and go look at them later. All right, so um, you all going to change your diets? Yep. All right, thank you very much. <laughs>